Good afternoon. My name is Lene Palmasano, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Budget Committee. I'm going to call to order our committee meeting for Monday, August 21st. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Payne. Present. Wansley. Present. Raindell. Present. Lita. Present. Ellison. Here. Osman is absent. Goodman is absent. President Jenkins. Present. Chavez. Present. Chugtai. Present. Johnson is absent. Vice President Palmasano. Present. Chair Koski is absent. There are nine members <clears throat> present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. Councilmember Koski regrets her inability to attend our need to try and schedule this meeting amongst a very busy uh, council calendar is the reason why um, she's not able to be here today. She's supposed to, she is on family vacation. Um, colleagues, the reason for our meeting today is to receive an update on change items in our last adopted budget. We have several staff on hand here to assist with that presentation, and we will begin by kicking it off with Kate Redden from the clerk's office. Welcome, thanks for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, members of the budget committee. My name is Kate Redden, and I am the manager of admin services for the legislative department. I am joined today by our city auditor, Ryan Patrick. May it please the committee, we are here to present the legislative department's 2023 budget change items and we will be speaking about a community safety audit work, the creation of the policy and research division, restructuring public safety data practices work, and funding not only for the 2023 municipal election, but also organization of the transition, inauguration, and orientation of the new city council. At this time, I'd like to invite Mr. Patrick to speak on the first two items. Thank you, welcome Mr. Patrick. Uh, Good afternoon, Council. I'll speak briefly to the several items, the change items for the City Auditor's Office, the first being the Community Safety Auditors. Um, those auditors were hired in quarter one of this year. They initially completed a community safety focused risk assessment presented to the Audit Committee, um, and that developed their annual work plan. Uh, in the interim, they've been working on consultations with the Emergency Communications Center neighborhood safety, and working on a data analysis of injured on duty claims. The second up would be the policy and research division of the city auditor's office uh, that you all have actually worked with and met. So in quarter one, we brought on our initial senior project managers uh, to assist in developing the program and beginning the initial consultations with the council. Since then, we've also filled uh, the management analyst position uh, as of this month, that would be Sarah Renner coming on board, and that team is taking on work. You had your first presentation back on uh, staffing, then on the consent decree work, and plenty more to come. Those were the two major change items for us. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions at this time. Thank you. Ms. Redden. Thank you. The next item is the public safety data practices restructure, and I do want to provide a bit of context because this process occurred over the course of two years. In February 2022, the city announced how it was going to change how public safety data practices tickets were responded to. Instead of delegating all requests of public safety data to MPD, a combined team in the clerk's office would address complex requests for police data, whereas the high volume transactional request and body worn camera would remain in MPD. This resulted in the transfer of five positions from MPD to the Information Governance Division of the Clerk's Office. The change initially started taking effect in May 2022 when we moved the MPD workers into a joint workspace with our existing staff. The MPD positions came over as a manager of police records, police sport technicians, and uh, business data analyst. The ongoing funding for the salary was moved and the reporting structure was changed under the Clerk's Office effective January 2023. As of this point, with the budget change item and one-time funding to remove 4,000 cases in a backlog project, the city now has a single team addressing all these requests, and we are now working towards uh, achieving a steady, a steady state. This would mean the same number of requests being received by the city are also being responded to each month, though the cases might not be the same. Uh, essentially, through this change item, we are working to provide the public with timely, accurate, and relevant data in a timely manner. The final two items for the legislative department relate to the 2023 municipal election. 
If you recall, this election is required due to the timing of the most recent uh, state and local redistricting process and is required only for the 13 city council member seats. Currently, the city finances elections in uh, kind of a two model approach. First, we provide a core base for essentially everything that keeps the lights on for the election division. That might be rent for our facility and our equipment, permanent staff salaries, and allocation models. Everything else that relates to the actual election is then requested and funded each year through the budget process. The election division was therefore allocated $2.1 million in one-time funding to administer this year's election. The election cycle just started with the candidate filing period and 38 candidates filing for office. Funding will essentially allow the city to hire about 75 to 85 temporary workers, 1,800 to 2,000 election judges, supplies and voting equipment for 137 election day voting precincts, and 146 day early vote center and ballot drop-off site. The division uh, continues to remain diligent in tracking local and national trends to modify their plans based off of what expected turnout levels will be. Therefore, the bulk of this funding will be spent in quarter three and quarter four of this year. After the results of the election are certified by the Municipal Canvassing Board in November, the City Clerk's Office will focus on the last change item, which is the 2023 transition orientation and inauguration for the newly elected City Council and their staff. 200,000 was allocated for these activities and is typically used for temporary staff salaries, technology needs for the temporary spaces, new office furniture and repairs to the surrounding structure, and activities regarding the inauguration such as event space rental fees, security, cleaning, photography, broadcasting, and other things that make these events open to the public. As a result, the bulk of this funding will be spent in quarter four of this year and quarter one of next year. For now, we are working with enterprise partners like Property Services, IT, Communications, Human Resources, and the Office of Public Service to prepare for these activities. With that, I'm happy to stand for any questions about those items. Thank you. We have two people in queue. The first is Councilmember Wansley. Thank you. Um, just clarification on the item around the public um, safety da data practice restructure. I know we got a presentation through POGO around that largely being taken up through contract work. Is that also being factored? I know you mentioned some type of a work group, but that was really crucial in helping address that 4,000. Is that also factor into this um, ongoing funding? Yep. Uh, Councilmember Pomisano to Councilmember Wansley. Yes, that contract through Robert Half has been a crucial aspect as it allowed us to bring on extra workers. And while we're still working to achieve a steady state, we're going to maintain those workers while we have that one-time project funding. Okay, so that would still go through to 2024 then, likely? Correct. Okay, awesome, thank you. Council President Jenkins. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Ms. Redden. My question is related to the elections. Um, you noted that this year there are 13 um, seats on the ballot, um, but you said the hiring. I'm wondering how is that different from a larger election or is it different? Do we have the same obligations for a 13 member 13 person election versus uh, 25 people on the ballot election. Councilmember Palmasano to um, Councilmember Jenkins. Yes, that's a really good question. We are expecting um, that the needs for this election won't be the same as next year's, which is a presidential. So while we are required to still open an early vote center and the same number of polling places, staffing numbers, general supplies, number of ballots we're printing, we're expecting not to be as high as normal. So that did go into the budget number that you saw reflected on the PowerPoint. However, I will say like with every election, we're always prepared for the unknown. 2020, we certainly weren't expecting to have to run an election during COVID-19. So there usually is some contingency planning in place. So where do we get staff if suddenly we see an uptick of turnout? Where do we go if we suddenly see um, extra need and particular ward for ballots? Those types of things. Hey, thank you. Thanks, I'm not seeing anybody else in queue. Thank you. Next, I'm not sure who's next in the queue. <laughs> City Attorney's Office, welcome Ms. Anderson. You've had a busy day already. <laughs> Indeed I have, thank you. Um, Council Vice President, uh, Council Members, just wanted to come and talk to you just a, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit about the change items and the status of the change items in the City Attorney's Office. 
Uh, the first uh, change item was with respect to a no, new position, uh, two new positions to create a charging team in the city attorney's office. Um, the purpose of this charging team is to really look at evidence before we charge cases. So really comprehensive looking at body-worn camera footage related to a, a potential charge, getting all the, a, the evidence together so we can make sure that the charges that we are bringing um, are uh, actually supported by the evidence um, and that we are, are charging things uh, fairly and, and equitably. Um, so that's what those two positions are. We have them now, of both of those positions um, assigned. These were internal assignments of folks uh, in the criminal division. Um, and, uh, and that work is underway. Uh, the second position um, is a position of a community attorney in the third precinct. Uh, you may be aware that we already had community attorneys in some of the other precincts, so this was adding another resource for there to be a community attorney in the third precinct. Um, th the purpose of the community attorneys is really to kind of twofold. Number one, to be a resource for law enforcement within the, the precinct to be able to answer real-time legal questions, um, and then also to be that liaison between law enforcement and community um, in terms of community questions, in terms of community meetings, um, this particular position um, is actively working on strategies to address crime on Lake Street um, and also how to connect individuals with their, the needed services at 1800 Chicago and, and other resources. So having that resource within the precinct is, is I think, a, a, a big benefit um, in terms of being that liaison between law enforcement and the community. Um, the third change item was with, to fund a Brady attorney. Um, our office has quite a robust Brady process that ensures that we comply with our legal obligations um, to disclose to criminal defendants any disco discoverable inculpatory or exculpatory evidence, um, including information on officer misconduct. So to fulfill our, our obligations there, this, this particular position is dedicated to actually reviewing all open and closed co complaint investigations um, conducted um, with respect to MPD officers, uh, either by internal affairs or by the Office of Police Conduct Review, um, assessing discoverability when looking at those investigative files, and then making determinations as to whether that information needs to be disclosed to um, criminal defendants in the cases that we prosecute, and then disclosing that, that information pursuant to, to protective order and, and other law. Um, this is also a resource that uh, is, is used from time to time when other jurisdictions uh, need to um, also disclose Brady type of information. This, this position is a liaison with, with other jurisdictions as well. Um, the next change item um, was to fund a, another attorney position. Um, we, we put that uh, position in the labor and employment law group. Um, labor and employment law in the city has become more and more active and more and more complex. Um, for example, in, in giving legal counsel on union negotiations. Um, so we determined that we need a, a third resource. We have two employment attorneys and we're adding a third employment attorney. Um, we have an offer out and hopefully we will have it accepted momentarily. This has been a difficult position um, to fill um, because frankly we are competing with the private sector for employment lawyers um, and we don't compensate um, in the same way that the, the private sector does. Um, but we now uh, again have an offer out and, and should be able to add that third HRLR uh, attorney um, to, to our, our team. And then the last change item is with respect to an enterprise information management analyst. This is our e-discovery expert. Um, you probably are all aware that litigation uh, has, has become, you know, really within the last decade or so, extraordinarily motivated by e-discovery. Um, the, the amount of uh, email that we all create, the amount of text messages that we all create in the course of doing our jobs, um, all of this stuff um, uh, winds up becoming part of litigation from time to time. So this resource was to develop the expertise and the capability um, and the implementation of a, of a sophisticated e-discovery um, resource for our office to be able to comply with the discovery obligations that we have in, in all of our cases. 
um, Council Member Wansley has a question or comment. Yes, thank you. Um, in regards to the assistant uh, attorney position that's going to be overseeing the Brady process, just interested in knowing um, how has having that position filled now and it sounds like a better infrastructure in place around managing that. How's that going in partnership with Hennepin County that it seems like they're still in a developmental phase or process with their Brady infrastructure? And I know that was a big um, point of, of, of concern when we had lots of conversations around our Brady processes last year. Uh, uh, Council Chair, Council Member Wansley, um, the, the relationship between the city and Hennepin County in terms of Brady is, you know, we're working on a memorandum of understanding that because, you know, frankly, the Data Practices Act doesn't allow for free flow of information between jurisdictions, so we need to kind of accomplish that through memorandums of understanding and through court orders. You know, we have actually met with Hennepin County District Court judges to talk about, you know, what the process might be in terms of making uh, it less burdensome for the court to issue court orders. We're working with Hennepin County with respect to memorandums of understanding. I think we're still, I don't think we've put the, the final uh, signature on that, although I might be mistaken, but um, but but this position is really critical for that. You know, both with respect to our own cases, obviously we prosecute mis misdemeanors and petty misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors, but having you know having kind of that central point of contact in our office, who's looking at all of these investigations and can be that liaison with um, Hennepin County and other jurisdictions is is you know a really really important feature of of this position's work as well. And then do you have kind of a, of a sense when that signature on the MOU might be coming in some time just to have that like understanding in place so that there is more efficiency of that exchange? Um, Council Member Wansley, I'm sorry, I don't know, and I might even be mistaken. It's possible that it's already signed, but I can get back to you on, on timing. Yes, if you could follow, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing other questions, but I did put myself in queue. Can you just help us understand, in your own words, um, the community attorney in the third precinct and the extra contractual services for it, what kind of positive impact that's had for the residents, the neighborhood businesses, the victims of crime in the third precinct? Can you just anecdotally even help us understand that? Um, yeah, I, I can try to do that. Um, Council Chair, uh, Council Members. Um, so again, as I, as I identified before, I think a, a big piece of this, so also we just very recently assigned someone to this position, so this is kind of nascent, um, but already I think that we're seeing, you know, kind of that liaison work um, really having fruit already, um, being able to have an attorney working on you know, both from the from the legal perspective and he hearing community voices about um, how to address crime on Lake Street. You know, doing it in a lawful manner um, and and being able to connect kind of those community voices with the law enforcement voices. I think has has already seen some fruit. Um, also, being able to um, identify individuals for needed services at 1800 Chicago. Um, I'm sure you're probably all aware that we do a lot of work around restorative justice in my office, so it's not about, you know, just getting convictions or maybe not even, uh, you know, getting a conviction. Sometimes it's, it's plea deals that will um, get folks to the services that they need rather than incarceration. And I think that this, this position being located in the third precinct and having, you know, kind of the community access, the access to the social services providers, you know, really puts them in a very unique position to be able to understand and access those 1800 services um, and connect up with then our office's folks who are working on the restorative justice, restorative court, um, alternatives to incarceration, you know, kind of marries all of those things that our office is doing together. And I think, um, you know, I'm very, very hopeful for um, the kind of positive in impacts that can be seen in, frankly, all of the precincts because of that, that liaison work. Thank you. And then just to try to see all of these change items through the lens of, like, what good has it done? Could you tell us those other three um, FTE, so the information management analyst, the Brady attorney, and then the city attorney and the civil di division. Can you help us understand what impact those three new FTEs um, made in regards to enhancing our legal services that we provide? 
Sure. Um, so the the charging team positions, again, you know, we these are pretty recent assignments to the charging team, um, but absolutely being able to to have dedicated folks who are looking at body worn camera footage, I think that's important for a, t a couple of reasons. Number one, obviously making sure that we have um, knowledge of all the evidence before we, we go forward with a charging decision, but also frankly having um, the eyes of attorneys in our office if there is something um, concerning in the, in the body worn camera footage in terms of um, officer's conduct. You know, we've got eyes on that and uh, have, have the ability to then raise that up and, and forward those things on for our internal affairs investigation. So I think that's, that's an important feature. And obviously, again, making sure that we are making charging decisions based on evidence, making sure that we're uh, aware of, of impacts, um, making sure that our charging decisions are, are um, again, based on evidence and not bias or, or any unlawful sorts of features. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, employment attorney position, again, we, we haven't hired it yet. I'm really knock on wood hopeful that we're almost there. Um, you know, I think that, that um, you've all seen um, the, the benefits of having strong labor and employment council for the city. Um, you know, we really want to get to the point of being able to do more proactive stuff and not, not just reactive. So being able to, to really be um, there to give advice and counsel for uh, labor negotiations, to be able to um, work on personnel policies and, and compensation plans and, and other things. So adding that third resource is really going to be able to um, let us look at the, the labor and employment city for the uh, a picture for the city in a more holistic and proactive sort of way. So, um, so very hopeful for that. Um, and the e-discovery um, enterprise information management analyst position, again, re recently appointed um, someone internally to that position, actually somebody who'd already been doing lots and lots of e-discovery, so that, you know, the appointment is new, but the work is not new. This person has been doing a fabulous job for a very long time for us, and, you know, we... I, even though she was not in this position at the time, she was very actively involved in working with uh, us on MDHR and DOJ and the, I think, hundreds of thousands of pages of documents um, and emails and, and all of those things that we produced in, in um, discovery to MDHR and DOJ. I mean, that's the kind of sophisticated, high-level e-discovery sort of of work that this position is really there for, um, and you know that kind of sophistication is needed really in all of our litigation cases. Thank you. I appreciate that detail. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, next, do we have OCS? Is that what's coming up next? Mr. Sheehy, welcome. Madam Chair, uh, Lee Sheehy, currently Deputy uh, City Operating Officer. Um, as I think the council is aware, on September 1st, I will be ser actually interim deputy. Here. Uh, on September 1st, I will be the interim uh, commissioner of uh, community safety. And I thought I'd use this opportunity to at least introduce myself to those I don't know. Um, and I thought it was probably putting uh, Mr. Jeffries in a difficult position to describe what he'd done. So I thought um, I would at least offer to, to do that. Uh, and I also wanted to listen to the council's discussion about the budget. So. Um, and I, so I will stay for the other presentations as well, but I'll let Mr. Jeffries orchestrate that. Uh, so Mr. Jeffries, as the chief of staff, helped Dr. Alexander stand up the office, take the five departments um, uh, that are part of that office and started to build it out. Um, I, w I wasn't here, so I can't speak to firsthand. I will say that the office has now stood up and the opportunities looking forward for the chief of staff and the office include um, with the recently release, released report on the uh, Minneapolis uh, Safe and Thriving Communities, um, bringing that to uh, uh, fruition in terms of design and reaching out to the community and start to provide some um, additional ways to, to think about a report that sets really high aspirations and expectations. Uh, Mr. Jeffries is learning a lot about onboarding of, of new folks. We have a new director, Brown, in the Office of Neighborhood Safety and we we'll soon have, uh, at least according to the mayor's comments, uh, uh, a new uh, uh, commissioner of uh, community safety, which I, I will assist on uh, that part of the transition. So it's, it's nice to be back. I haven't been here for many years, but nice to be back in front of the council and happy to answer any questions 
Otherwise, I probably took it over to the person who is more knowledgeable than I. Thank you. I'm seeing Councilmember Wansley. Thank you. Thank you. I'm interested to know, um, and Councilmember Ellison, you might can help me on this. I believe we got the presentation on OCS or chart either in POGO or, also, or PHS, Public Health and Safety. And that's where we saw additional staff positions based off of moved, um, I believe it was a, a crime prevention specialist. Um, those positions were gonna be used to allocate four additional staffing positions, it seems like for this year, um, for strictly media relations. So um, it's interesting to know why there's an absence of those positions since that was uh, it seems like rolled out for 2023, not 2024. And if there's a change of scope um, in those positions in light of the work that needs to happen per Dr. Oftelli's report. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Councilman Wansley, it's a good question, thank you. Uh, of those four positions, one currently uh, uh, serve, uh, serves the PIO um, work and communications work with the police department. Um, one is in the Office of Community Safety uh, soon, to, soon to be higher, um, and then the two have not been filled in part to create the opportunity, I think the council, the, the council member suggests, of the broader message of uh, opportunity that the, that the uh, Office of Community Safety can look at in community safety issues and others, as well as providing support for the other uh, four departments. Um, they did come from the other four departments, which I think you suggest. So we have an obligation to our colleagues in those departments to make sure that uh, they have communications needs uh, served as well. Thank you, and just a quick follow-up on that, because I do believe in uh, the mayor's uh, 2024 budget, there was an allocation of two positions per recommendations for the Dr. Oftelli report. Is I'm assuming then the two positions that's not fulfilled right now that was originally relegated for the media relations position is it the hope that those will then occupy this new uh, scope? I would say that I'm, in part, I wanna leave that to the new commissioner, but I think that the, the, the way that you're articulating it is the way that we're trying to think about how they can provide that service and, and um, to that initiative. But I, I, I'm, I'm cautious in this interim role to not commit the new commissioner to specifics. So I would say that the questions you've raised are ones that are under discussion within the office. And that's just also good for this body to know because I believe Mayor Fry wrote that out as a potential uh, new addition or new staffing. Um, and if that's not the case, so the excitement of, oh, well, we have four new FTEs or just two that's being um, reclassified under this new scope of work. Um, so I think it's the getting clarity on, are we getting four towards the Dr. Oftelli or just two just rebranded? So, and it seems like there needs to be follow-up on that. Or maybe Jared might have some understanding on that. I think it's, it's a good time to pass the question. Thank, thank <laughs> yeah. you for the question. Thank you. Mr. Jeffries. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Members. Um, just to clarify, Council Member Wansley, uh, it was three positions that the mayor added. Those were new positions. They Those were, are new? Yes. And so then, and then these two will go uh, in addition to supporting that work. As Mr. Sheehy said, um, mm -hmm. tentatively, yes, but that's gonna be in part dependent on decisions that need to be made by the new permanent commissioner. So there could be a world per the new department commissioner where we could have five FTEs dedicated towards the Dr. Oftelli work implementation efforts. Correct, and I think as the mayor said in his budget address, that's kind of the beginning mm -hmm. of that work. Um, oh. So not, not the end result, but to the beginning. Okay, just wanted to get clear yeah. clarity on like staffing allocations around that. So thank you for providing that. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. My uh, remarks are directed towards uh, Mr. She. I just wanted to welcome you and thank you for taking this interim position. You've served the public so well. You've been a public servant. Uh, in government and nonprofits, and uh, you're coming here at a very tough time, and it's a very important time. So if there's anything that my office can do to help, please uh, do not hesitate to ask. But I, again, I just wanna thank you for stepping up to the plate, and I uh, really appreciate your effort. Thank you. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing anybody else in queue. Go ahead, Mr. Jeffries. 
So I will walk through um, each of these of, for the departments within the Office of Community Safety. And then I have department leadership here who can answer any specific questions on these items. Um, so for, as you'll see, for neighborhood safety in 2023, um, there are two items that were changed or added in the budget for neighborhood safety department. Um, the first being a $50,000 earmark for youth coordinating board summer activities. Those have been completed. Uh, those were actually three contracts um, that were worked through the Youth Coordinating Board and Neighborhood Safety Department that funded projects, as you'll see here, um, helping children and young adults um, in re to re-engage, recover, and accelerate learning and development uh, after the severe disruptions of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, those have been completed, and I believe we have an anticipated report out on that um, due back to the Neighborhood Safety Department at the end of this month. Um, the second um, item, which I think you're all aware of, is the budget move of the Behavioral Crisis Response um, Program. The increase in 2023 was $1.45 million. Um, that budget transfer, what is complete um, in the contracting and program transition, um, is just about final as well, moving from PMI over to neighborhood safety. Um, and obviously the, the end goal of that is to build that trust efficiency within the city's emergency response and uh, public safety generally. Um, and also noteworthy, um, as um, actually stated in the mayor's budget address, um, the $1.45 million for this year um, and an additional 1.45 million in 2024, bringing the total increase from 2022 to 2.9 million. Um, and that will be, um, so the 1.45 million is already effectuated and the other additional 1.45 is planned for 2024. Happy to take questions on that or defer to Director Nelson Brown for any additional specifics. Thank you, we have a couple, Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you uh, outline the process for that transfer? I know that the budget dollars on paper have been transferred over to neighborhood safety, but for BCR day-to-day -day management, is that still in PMI? And at, like, what's our plan for transition around that? Yeah, so um, that has been the actual programmatic part has been transitioning throughout the course of this year. Started almost at the very beginning of this year, just the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, what does administering this program look like? Um, that is near completion now. Um, we're almost at a complete handoff where the day-to-day -day is moving over to neighborhood safety. Um, and we'll have right now two staff dedicated to that administration working with Canopy um, on just the troubleshooting, on invoicing, on type of all types of logistical parts that actually go into the back end of, um, of the, the success of this program and working closely with Canopy um, and leadership there. Council Member Wansley. Thank you. Just clarification for the additional uh, allocation for 2024. Is that um, factoring in the contract extension that the, co the council just approved via POGO? Uh, yes, it is, okay. Councilmember Wansley. Um, that is, um, so that was the actual contract extension. Mm -hmm. um, that is obviously the dollar amount and the services. The actual budget increase is to account for an additional vans that will be added to the program. So going from three vans to five vans. So that'd be five vans for 2025. Uh, oh, 2024. Sorry, 2024. Correct. Okay, and then the additional, because I believe it was a one-year contract, we approve an extension to two. Yes. And that's being reflected in the 2.9. Yes. So, okay, thank you. Right. Council Member Vita. Thank you, Vice President Palmasano. Uh, Mr. Jeffries, you said that the uh, groups from the Youth Coordinating Board, three groups were funded for this work? Uh, Chair Palmasano, Council Member Vita, I believe that is correct, yes. Do you know who those three groups are? Yeah, I'll bring up Director Nelson Brown to answer Thank that question you. specifically. Welcome, Director Nelson. Thank you. Thank you so much for that welcome. Council Member Vita, yes, that is correct. There are three contracts. Um, the first was to the Church of St. Stephen. Um, they did a program that was a Latino cultural summer camp. Um, they worked with about 50, well, 50 youth ages 6 to 13 who live in the Whittier and Phillips neighborhoods. Um, they concluded um, just right at the end of July. 
So we're receiving reports right now. Um, HITP Hoops was the second program. Um, I think that stands for Hard in the Paint <laughs> Programming. They did programming to 300 youths, ages 8 to 17, who live in both South and North Minneapolis, basketball programs in five different locations. And then the third was Plymouth Christian Youth Center. Um, they did bright future programming to 70 youth in grades K through 5 who live or attend school in North Minneapolis, and they're connected to the North Side Achievement Zone. And those programs wrapped up as, just as early as this past Saturday. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, Chair? No. We'll go ahead and move into uh, police. So um, there were a number of non-personnel items changed or added in 2023. Um, there are two slides on this, so I will pause the end of this slide and see if there's any questions before we proceed. Uh, the, first, uh, the first change was an additional $739,000 ongoing um, to fund the Police Pathways Program. Um, as you'll see here, approximately 31, is that right, Chief Staff Gators? Um, or DC, or AC Gators now. Um, 31 interns went through this, um, this intern program this summer. Um, including traditional uh, police executive research um, program in historically black colleges and universities. Um, and this was, um, from all accounts, a very successful year for this program. If there are questions or more specifics on that, I'll defer to AC Gators. Um, for Lake Street Safety Center, there's an additional $25,000, I believe, one-time earmark um, that was added to the budget last year. Um, that, um, for just a reminder, um, was a partner, an intended partnership with Hennepin County, Metro Transit, and community organizations to fund a um, kind of shared Lake Street Safety Center space where um, kind of all of our safety programming um, in that space can have a presence and um, kind of have that, um, that accessibility for the, the Lake Street corridor. Um, that is in progress currently. In the future of that work is being coordinated by those organizing the center itself, so our jurisdictional partners and community groups. Um, and I anticipate we'll have further movement on that here in the coming months. And then lastly for this slide, um, there is another $25,000 earmark one time added for um, this year for auto theft prevention. And that was specifically to fund the um, 500 purchased and donated clubs that have been distributed, so car clubs to prevent auto thefts that have been distributed um, and will continue to be distributed this summer. Any questions on this slide? Councilmember Wansley. Thank you. A uh, question for DC Gators in terms of the Pathways Program. Hi, DC. Um, with the 31 interns, do you have a breakdown of the ratio between interns that were solicited or approved in-state versus out-of-state through some of those you mentioned, like HBCU uh, programs? Yeah, Chair and uh, Council Member Wansley. Yes, the uh, 31 interns, there was one that was uh, out-of-state. Mm -hmm. That was from the uh, historically black colleges and universities, the HBCU. Mm -hmm. uh, all others were inside of Minneapolis. So 30 from Minneapolis through the traditional programs that you mentioned either, did you see some trends where a majority came from of these partnerships? Uh, Chair and council member, uh, yes, anecdotally, uh, they were all from Minneapolis, but most were from the inner city and that's where we were targeting the areas where uh, our um, opportunities that we had been given in the past, we felt we could do better. And uh, we strategically went at uh, areas that were impacted by a lack of having opportunities to, to take on inter internships with our police department and areas that were impacted by violence. Right. And any key partnerships that were very helpful in that in terms of like, I know, you know, certain groups or schools pivotal for like higher ed, just getting a sense of, yeah, how folks knew and were able to like get that access. Chair and Council Member, uh, we uh, worked in partnership with our Step Up program, mm -hmm. 
and uh, they were a great partner in this process. And uh, uh, at the end of the program, at least the summer phase of the program, uh, we had all uh, participants who were very pleased with the program and were looking to come back. But Step Up was a, was a great partnership in that piece. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Vice President Palmasano. Just quickly shout out to Jayla, who was a part of that program. She was the only student from the HBCU, and um, I got to meet with her and try to convince her to come to Minneapolis full time. She's from the South, so that did not work out. She's very afraid of the weather. So we'll see if she comes back, though. Um, I had a question around, similar to what Councilmember Wansley's talking about, the partnership between schools. So Assistant Chief Gators, could you please come back up? I'd been talking to the chief about a partnership that would uh, work directly with Minneapolis Public Schools because I know we have programming where we could get kids in um, the career path for either fire or police, you know, where they could work as community service officers. So I'm wondering if that was a part of this program or what's the future of that look like with Minneapolis Public Schools? And Chair and uh, Councilmember Vietal. Yeah, that was not a part of the program uh, working in uh, partnership with the fire department. Uh, that is something that we'll have ongoing talks about, but we're definitely interested in okay. that program as well. Councilmember Ellison's mother is on the school board. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, any further questions, Chair? This one? Uh, no. All right, moving on through the non-personnel items added for the police department. Uh, there was also a one-time $500,000 earmark added for community safety projects. I believe that was for street outreach and engagement. Um, that RFP has been posted. Um, I think it was either has closed or will close soon. Um, and those proposals will be evaluated um, in the coming weeks here. Um, for law enforcement support, there's a $1.35 million dollar um, one-time funding allocation um, that was going towards uh, State Patrol, Fridley, um, PD, and a few others to provide um, uh, mutual aid assistance for the police department this year. Um, those partnerships remain ongoing um, and continue to be very important for their, uh, our community safety um, enforcement uh, mechanisms. And then lastly, um, the overtime, the one-time overtime allocation um, that um, is complete, um, MPD anticipate, anticipates a budget deficit due to overtime exceeding that $2 million. Um, and these um, additional, these funds have already been spent, the $2 million. Um, I think that covers it for the police department. If there are any further questions, we have to take them now. As I take a look, uh, ah, Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the overtime, can you just um, unpack just structurally how that unfolds? You know, how it is, how it, my understanding is that we're running over budget on overtime. So, how many times have we had to make those adjustments? And then, what's been the impact of, um, you know, we just approved over time to go to the state fair as an example and how is that like how are those types of external whether it's a buyback or off duty which I know is not technically overtime but how are those contributing to our budget when it comes to overtime um what AC Blackwell or AC Gators into this one I don't know if you want to. Madam President Councilmember Payne Katie Blackwell, Assistant Chief of Operations. So I'm, I'm going to try to understand your question and explain it. Uh, so the overtime impact that in, back in 2019, we're seeing a double uh, overtime because we're, we're paying cops at time and a half or double to fill vacancies that we're still trying to backfill our pipeline through the academy. And then there's buyback out there that if there's an officer that buyback is that flat rate that's the city charges um, for those. We, we generally will pull them back into the fold if we need them on the street if we're at facing that critical staffing shortage. Mm -hmm. And then we're also focused on the different precincts pulling, and basically we're trying to exhaust all means before offering double overtime. Uh, off duty is a completely separate thing that is negotiated through businesses. Mm -hmm. and did that answer your question? Yeah, and I'm, I, well I'm curious, you know, we're at two million, 
in terms of a budget, but if we were to have said $1 million, our budget for overtime, and then we realize we're going to blow right past that, what, how does that unfold? So I think uh, Director McPherson is not here today, but she she is uh, definitely keeps an eye on all the overtime. and what, So there's some things that we, we can't foresee, right, where we have to cancel days off if something unforeseen happens um, that she tries to plan ahead to in her budget. Um, but we stay on top of it by looking at it. We just did another memo to restrict a lot of double time pay and going through exhausting other means before we just jump right into that, that overtime pay. But the community has been overwhelmingly wanting to see police out there and to try to help alleviate our response times. Um, we're trying to fill those, those staffing as best we can for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, this might be a question for Ms. McPherson, but um, do you happen to know, uh, this was a change for additional funding for overtime. Do you recall what the existing funding was included for the current service level for overtime? Like, so we added $2 million more million, but how much did we anticipate, how much do we normally have in it? You're asking what the initial amount was, Chair? Uh, I don't know that information, but we can get it to you, though. Um, we can pull that pretty easily, so we can get that to you after the meeting if that works. Yeah. And then what is anticipated to be spent on overtime for the rest of the year? I think it was mentioned that um, we anticipate a deficit. Oh, it's on the slide here. The MPD anticipates a budget deficit due to overtime exceeding the budget. Um, and I know we can't predict unforeseen circumstances, um, but just if we keep on moving at the pace that we are, um, Uh, we're at this point, sorry, still rough estimations, but I think we had said somewhere in the ballpark of um, the total, I think, was four or five million. On uh, over budget. Sorry, clarify, that's a total budget shortfall, so not just overtime, but of the, the of total MPD budget. But if you want to break down of the overtime specifically, Chair, we can get that to you as part of those, those follow-up numbers. I am curious, as we look to right-size things, we know we aren't going to um, grow our force exponentially between now and the end of the year, and I just want to make sure we're accounting for it in next year's budget as we look forward to that process. So thank you. Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I don't know who can help me if it's uh, a Deputy Chief Blackwell or Gators, but uh, I believe that uh, Councilmember Payne, when he stated that we allocated overtime for the State Fair Horse Patrols, I believe that is not correct. It's my understanding that those officers are doing that on their days off. So they're, they're vol in essence giving up their vacation time, time off to help at the State Fair. Correct. So it's uh, uh, it's like working off duty. Sorry, Madam Chair, Council Member. Uh, it is it's basically an off duty job working at the State Fair, and then the Mount of Patrol is more of a special duty, like going over there to assist them mm -hmm. on our time. But the point I'm trying to make is uh, they're giving up their their days off to go over there. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Council and then I had a second question. The uh, $500,000 earmark, I remember us allocating that in the budget process, and uh, Mr. Jeffers, I'm just wondering, do you have a date or a timeline for allocation? It would seem to me that to not have that allocated by August is uh, not very efficient. Yeah, um, Chair, Councilmember Rainville, so that one was um, something that was a capability that did not currently exist in MPD as far as like that specific type of activity. So it kind of needed to be built out to adapt to what was being requested or funded there. And so that's part of the delay in actually getting it set up. Um, and so it was, uh, we, I think collectively wanted to do it intentionally, wanted to do it right. And so um, it did take a little bit more time. I think any of us wanted to, but um, trying to plan for what we can now here. So again, my question is, do you have a date or a time frame for allocation? Uh, we believe in within two weeks here. Two weeks? Yes. Thank you. Councilmember Payne? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I should probably clarify my question because it appears to be some confusion. I was asking the impact of both 
uh, buyback and basically outside dollars buying overtime work. I'm assuming that doesn't hit this budget. So if we allocated $2 million for overtime, uh, but there is an intersection in that time and a half versus double time is gonna happen depending on what that availability is. So I was curious, both does a buyback contract uh, reduce how we calculate those overtime budgets and based on those buyback details, are we getting into more double time scenarios? Chair, Councilmember Payne, I, I believe I understand your question. I'll look to our ACs here, but I believe buyback is separate from overtime as far as the, I think, I think you're clear on that. Um, but are you asking the indirect impacts of? Correct, when they're out doing details, you know, hitting the cap of what hours they can work and what days they can work. Are we getting into more double time? Madam Chair, Council Member. Uh, so I would say no, because with the buyback completely separate, it's basically a sheet that goes out to officers that are available on their off time to fill that. And then each officer has to work at critical staffing overtime. That's part of the, the budget. And so each month they will do that. And then we have uh, different guardian beats that we will, we will fold into the mix within the precincts. So with the two separate, that's not two separate funding pools. And then what, what triggers double time versus time and a half? Sure, so critical staffing overtime is, is how we're, we're making up the difference of our, our short staffing in the precincts. And so each officer will have to work one extra mandatory day for the, for the double time. And then there's special events that come up or special details, I should say, kind of unplanned or last minute is where we're putting in the CSOT. So it's used on a limited basis with the chief's approval. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Wansley. Thank you. Um, I just had a clarifying question of, uh, one, with the community safety projects, do we have a list of partners that have been awarded this? And then what I'm also seeing missing from 2023, which is something that we approved, was actually brought forward by Councilmember Rainville of Warehouse Live or District Live um, and getting a sense, especially since we're talking about overspending MPD's budget, um, where did those dollars come from? I had thought it had also received some of the earmark funding, but that's not being represented here. And if there's any other external um, proposals that council approved, um, for instance, council member VTOS, well, no, that's for 2024, but the additional bonuses that were approved by this council, but just seeing some of those external things that weren't originally included as change items, how that's factor into this budget, but also the list of those partners, if we have any. Chair, Councilmember Wansley, uh, I believe um, we have not yet selected or extended offers to vendors, so we don't have those lists, but we can forward them to council once we once those are completed contracts. So you have not staggered those contracts out throughout the year? That it's been somewhat a one-stop shop for this specific initiative? Yes, um, that is correct. Uh, to Councilmember Rainville's qu earlier question, the capability as far as like what that funding was designed for didn't exist within the police department previously. And so that's what we were trying to adjust and adapt to. Um, so if that answers mm -hmm. your question on that. And then funding around warehouse, where did that factor into this here? I believe that is in the OPS side. I'm not entirely sure. I think that may have gone into, I'm not exactly sure. That, I don't believe that ended up going into the police department. Um, yeah, it, Ramon, it came out of MPD's oh, budget, correct? Got it, yes. yes. So that yeah. should show up elsewhere in this presentation, I believe. Perfect. Because this, I, I, this is not um, everything that came out of the police department, just what was changed internally or added. Good to know, just is, yes. since it seems to factor under the non-personnel piece. Okay. I think uh, our CFO, Dushani, could <laughs> Thank you, Dushani. answer that question. We want to do it now. <laughs> Thank you, and welcome, Director Dai. To the chair, Council Member Wansley, the district live um, funding did come from police department. It was charged directly to the police department. There was no transfer out. So there are general budget dollars paid yes. for it. Yes. And that's the same general budget dollars that's going to be in an anticipated deficit. If it's anticipated, it will be. Mm, good to know. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any further questions, Chair? Please. I'm not seeing any. And then um, lastly for our department changes, uh, the fire department received a $245,000 allocation, $200,000 of it go ongoing starting in 2024 um, for to replace the incident reporting software that the fire department uses. That's in progress um, and is expected to go before council for approval but before the end of August. Um, happy to um, answer any questions or defer to um, Assistant Chief Rucker and uh, Director Scardili. I'm not seeing any questions. Could you clarify incident reporting software is for calls, like 911 types of calls? I'll let Assistant Chief Rucker answer that question. Welcome, Chief. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Madam Chair and uh, Council members. Um, so the incident reporting uh, software is to uh, report our incidents, uh, and it's called Firehouse. Um, so that uh, software has uh, sunsetted, um, and it was extended to 2024. Um, so we were replacing that software with um, Image Trend. Uh, and currently, uh, we are. Um, moving forward, uh, PRC has approved a five-year uh, contract to move forward to come uh, for in front of council uh, shortly. So it is our um, fire incident reporting system of how we um, mark and, and, and what do you call it, um, describe what our incidents are, um, and then also moving forward to, uh, to the state as well I see thank you and so then ongoing is the ongoing cost of the software it's maintenance and troubleshooting etc from an IT perspective affirmative affirmative uh, council member Wansley. thank you sorry director Ruckner this is not for you but I just wanted a clarification on the community safety contracts uh, Jeffrey just uh, as your you know, having the pending decision point on those contracts. Um, I'm assuming the approved RFPs will either come through POGO or would it be through PHS for the council to consider? I believe it would be PHS, but I need to double check that. But okay, if we so. could get a uh, follow up on that, just to be clear of when those will come through. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, and lastly for OCS, um, as you'll see here, this is a slide just um, noting all of the FTE transfers. So none of these positions were actually added, but actually transferred uh, to these departments or offices um, for neighborhood safety as it was moved out of health as the Office of Violence Prevention. It was the 19.65 FTEs um, from the government structure, and then two additional FTEs um, that were added from NCR as part of the government structure as well. Um, for OCS, you'll see six um, overall that were taken from communications, NCR, and MPD. Um, the two from communications and MPD, those were the media relations um, positions that uh, Mr. Sheehy referenced previously. And then the um, two from NCR um, are currently, I believe, the aide to the commissioner and the director of partnerships and outreach position that went through council earlier this year. Um, and then for MPD, you'll see um, 11 FTEs were transferred from NCR. Those were the crime prevention specialists. Um, two FTEs um, from uh, to the auditor. Um, five FTEs transferred to the clerk. Two FTEs transferred to OCS, which is uh, noted above. And then three FTEs transferred to PMI. Um, so happy to answer any questions on that. I'm not seeing any. Thank you. Thanks for that wrap up. That's helpful. Absolutely. Director Johnson. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair, members of the council. Um, I have a lot of slides and a lot of help here behind me. A lot of the department leaders will jump in here if you have detailed questions. So I'll try to go through these relatively quickly since I think you're familiar with uh, many of them. But um, I'm going to start with the Office of Public Service and um, the uh, new positions. The City Operations Officer position um, was created as part of the uh, voter approved ballot initiative that was um, really not a new position as much as conversion of the city coordinator position into this role. 
Um, and that is, there was a national process for that, and that is going um, forward in, uh, sometime this fall. The next item is the Deputy City Operations Officer for Internal Services. That was taking um, the Deputy um, City Coordinator position and converting it into that uh, position as part of the uh, governance restructure, and that position has been filled. The next is the Deputy City Operations Officer for Development Health and Livability. Um, as you heard earlier, Ali Sheehy was filling that role on an interim basis and it has been posted and planned to uh, close that position on September 1. This is part of the new government restructure that the council passed in October as well. Uh, city uh, Senior Event Coordinator, this is currently filled with a detail. I have 30 plus events um, that this person has been working on. I think what we have, we've had that position sort of off and on over the years, um, just really when we've had really significant events and what we've found is that we can really make this easier for folks to have events in our city if we have an ongoing position and that was the rationale when this position was funded. Um, this works on, this position works on things like the Aquintennial Torchlight Parade, Holly Dazzle, Uptown Art Fair, the Loppet, many others, I, a Pride Parade. Um, I could list all 30, but I think in the interest of time, if you'd like that list, I'll forward that on. Um, also, we are continuing this position, not just works on events that are coming, but also on future events. Um, we have been working to really streamline the processes within our city to make it easier to have events. I know that there have been questions related, for example, to the Pride Festival. I mean, time is money, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to make this easy for people to have, um, have a streamlined process for having events in our city as well. The second position, um, and that position, the Senior Events Coordinator, that detail has been in place since the end of, of November, and we are planning on posting that soon. Um, and I know just for the public's information, um, we talk a lot about details here, which might not mean something to the people um, who are listening, but we often have uh, our current employees are allowed to detail to a different position to give them really professional development experience. And we found that that's been a very useful tool for folks to try something out, see if they like it, and then they either return to their own position or um, sometimes they will apply for that position as they go forward. The senior project manager position, I think a lot of you have heard about this, the biggest projects, um, that is currently filled with a detail as well. Um, and that has been filled with a detail since January of this year. Um, that person has been working on uh, the third precinct engagement process in partnership with our colleagues at NCR as well as really leading the work at George Floyd Square. You all are gonna get a very detailed update on uh, George Floyd Square, Square coming up in September and all of those different um, activities as part of that. Um, we found a real need for project management. What we're really trying to do is make sure that all departments are working together. And in order to get them to work together, we need somebody who's making sure that that happens. And that's been really fruitful in our work um, at George Floyd Square, which you all will be hearing about next month, uh, to make sure we're, not, we're taking advantage of um, all of the different uh, opportunities and that come with having different departments doing work in that area. Um, oh, and that is, we are going to post for a permanent position um, in that area as well very soon. So the next, uh, I'll pause there for just a second, otherwise I'm going to keep going. Okay, arts and cultural affairs personnel. Um, this is our first time that we have a, an arts department, um, and we, are, we have a new arts director, which you all are aware, has been hired. And this is all part of the government structure uh, efforts as well. Um, we are currently almost fully staffed. We are, have uh, had a departure, and so um, we are in the process of filling the executive manager of arts position, and the interviews will begin at the beginning of September for that position. Uh, civil rights um, personnel, the case investigator positions have both been filled. Uh, this is in, in order to increase the investigative capacity of civil rights, OPCR, um, and reduce existing caseload demands. Uh, the second position, administrative analyst two, um, is in progress to, they're continuing to build capacity to help um, have an administrative person help with the process pieces, and then others are able to work on the investigative parts. 
non-personnel, uh, the $30,000 for the Community Commission on Police Oversight. Uh, as you all know, this is a newly, newly created or constituted uh, com commission with uh, the work that you all had done this, uh, this spring and summer. And the, they have had their first meeting and this group will have a, a public data portal and so this is to help get that work up and running including um, getting just sort of the, this portal up and going and other things, so. Communications personnel, uh, the first position, the video specialist is, uh, has been completed. This is in order to provide additional access uh, to our public for independent, board, independent bodies, commissions, and boards um, that have been identified with a city clerk uh, to move forward and have additional resources there. The inter interagency coordinator position has been recently filled. This is uh, trying to have dedicated representation at interagency meetings to really facilitate the, uh, the communication among all the different departments. Uh, Non-personnel in the communications department, you'll see the in increase of $100,000 on ongoing um, we really have eight different uh, cultural media partners, and this is to expand um, our multicultural uh, media programming as well as, um, I don't think um, this is, does not include translation services, but it's really having specific contracts with those partners. The next, we have a lot here in community planning and economic development, a lot of investments here. The director of planning position has been filled. Um, and it was frozen, as you know, this is one of the frozen positions in uh, 2020, uh, and that position has been filled. The manager of equity and inclusion uh, has also been filled. This was a, a transfer from the coordinator's office, and this really is for the promise zone work uh, that is ongoing and helps with uh, economic development uh, with a lot of focus on uh, north side communities, but other communities as well. Uh, there are four, Point seven five uh, filled positions that were expiring. These are ARPA funded and now are ongoing um, positions within the general fund. Uh, this gives us some stability in some of these programs that I think were very successful as we move forward um, as we saw in the pandemic. The Commercial Property Development Fund, $2 million of one-time resources. Um, so we are in the process, we have either committed or are in the process of committing all the the, the funding for commercial real estate projects. Um, this is really focused on financing small businesses and emerging uh, developers, especially from BIPOC communities. Development fund funding swap. So these were swapped in and out for personnel exper experiences. This will, again, allow for long-term stability and personnel funding. Dreamland on 38th Street development prog progress, that's $500,000 in one time uh, resources, the loan terms were approved in March, working with development partner to close the loan, and so that we would expect in the next couple months. Um, and this will continue to implement the 38th Street Thrive program, um, as well as in, uh, implement recommendations from the Inclusive Economic Development Work Group. Okay, some additional uh, funding within uh, CPAD, the Cultural Market Small Business Support, $400,000 in one-time resources. Uh, we are looking through those programmatic guidelines um, with the city attorney's office, and um, we'll bring them back to you, we think, either late summer or early fall. Uh, these are really looking at um, helping support uh, different, different operators that have uh, helped keep uh, people in housing during the pandemic. Uh, software license fees, these are to be used for Salesforce. This is transitioning the Salesforce licensing expenses from the original project to an ongoing basis as we're continuing to use that software. Okay, Black Business Week, we have talked, we've kind of pieced together Black Business Week in the past and um, you all had were graciously provided funding, ongoing funding of $30,000 for the, the Black Business Week programming. Um, as you know, it was a very successful and I think you got a, a separate um, a separate update on all of those activities, and so this is really helping um, have this be an ongoing uh, effort at the city, and um, 
we had gone back and forth in terms of whether that should be in REIB um, or CPED, and I believe that REIB is in agreement that this um, is really an economic development uh, activity. So uh, the one time, the budget proposal for Zara, $1 million of one time, they're in the process of negotiating the loan, loan terms. And this is a, a black run organization of business incubators on West Broadway. And I do, and on some of these things, if there's other questions, please let me know. Um, Rise Up, $250,000 of one time funding. Again, this is another loan to create workforce access opportunities for residents in and around the Lake Street area. Promise zone rent, this is somewhat of a technical co correction in that the rent um, went up for our promise zone activities. We like to have um, that person housing, officing out of the community and so this is uh, a, was a transfer of a dollar amount that had been covered within the coordinator's office at the time um, into CPED to cover that rent. Community outreach and safety program, $1 million of one time um, money. We expect to award those contracts later this summer um, this is uh, really in support of community safety specialist positions within the community organizations. So we've done a, a number of pilot uh, programs, as you can see there, and including the escalation in mental health. So um, that we will continue to evaluate those programs. Community, the next item, $150,000 of one-time money for expansion to South Minneapolis of the community safety strategies. Uh, this expansion will bring uh, additional safety and economic development opportunities in the south side, similar to what was done, um, piloted in the north side. Uh, the next three items, or the next two items, excuse me, are for the Public Housing Authority, um, $2.7 million of one-time uh, funding uh, to really get at some of the critical maintenance that you all have heard about on an ongoing basis, or excuse me, um, within the, the public housing authorities uh, uh, owned complexes. So bidding is in process, and we'll schedule those maintenance, that maintenance to begin in third quarter. Uh, $1.2 million of one-time CDBG block grants is also in the contracting phase currently, and expect construction around the same timeline to do some additional, this is specifically uh, related to fire suppression in those units. Affordable Housing Trust Fund, there's a $9.863,864 million, uh, one time in 2023 and 2024. Uh, proposals are due in the third quarter and we'll bring them forward to the City Council in the fourth quarter. Um, this is really gap financing for uh, production and um, preservation of rental housing. Uh, the next items in terms of the office to end homelessness, $25,000 um, is under contract with Hennepin County. Uh, this is to support the ongoing staff, uh, or excuse me, the ongoing partnership with Hennepin County. Uh, we have uh, used some of this funds for the lived experience advisory group, as well as um, increasing availability through the coordinated efforts of Hennepin County as well, working together. Minneapolis Homes, there are two different sources of funding, $508,000 of one time, and then $2 million in 2024. Um, we are creating uh, uh, some additional unit developments to, to that are perpetually affordable with that money, and we expect to bring those back to the City Council in fourth quarter. Um, the last natural occurring affordable housing, $1.5 million, um, it's being prepared for release in Q3 and uh, dispersing those funds in the fourth quarter. Um, it's really acquiring properties from the post-pandemic housing market. Did I miss anything? Are you okay? All right. If I could interrupt you here, Councilmember yes. Wansi. Great. Thank you. Um, in regards to the office in homelessness, um, has there been any evaluation of the effectiveness of this, this partnership so far in terms of as you're doing somewhat consideration of continuing this contract? And then is there also a comparison or will we get a presentation on the regulatory service department um, homeless response team to also kind of factor in in 2023, how much did we actually devote towards addressing our unsheltered community? Um, 
Madam Chair, Council Member Wansley, uh, I'll, I'll take your first, second question first, which is um, we'll certainly be talking about the um, investment in regulatory services related to the unsheltered uh, work, and so that'll happen through the budget process as well. We'll be talking about that. Um, in terms of your first question, mm -hmm. I'm not aware that there has been an evaluation at this point in time, but it's certainly something that we'll look at. Um, this has, I think this contract has only been in place less than a year, and so, but we can look at that and I'll make a note of it. So, And would that evaluation likely go through who? Would that be uh, internal department? Madam Chair, Council Member Wadsley, I'll have to get back to you on that, and I'll talk mm -hmm. with the, two, the folks that have been involved with this and, and uh, get back to you with a better answer. Okay, sounds good. Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, next budget proposal, so I'm moving on to finance and property services, the uh, personnel. First is the capital budget analyst. This position has been filled, and this is really to help support the click process as well as to have uh, financial coordination um, with the CIP and just really integrating, making sure we're integrating equity proposals and risk management into the CIP as well. The next position is policy and research. This position has been filled. Um, this is um, allows for better financial planning and coordination. This also is related to the CIP. Next, I'll move on to health. If there are any questions, um, the first personnel is sustaining school-based service clinics. We've got $223,000 um, in 2023, and then $443,000 in 2024 and ongoing. Um, this has been completed. These are, this allowed us to retain um, four grant funded positions, and this really provides physical and mental health services with an integrated school based primary care model. Sustainability, as you all know from the governance structure, um, a lot of these positions uh, were transferred from the coordinator to have one sustainability group within the health department. Um, that the transfer of positions has been completed, and that really has um, helped us prioritize environmental justice and really set the goals um, in a collaborative manner across all of the different people working on sustainability efforts. The last um, item on the per this personnel page slide is the tree program coordinator. This position has been filled, um, and this is trying to uh, have the work plan primarily is related to the tree canopy um, across the city and um, an educational campaign as well. Non-personnel items related to the, from the health department. Uh, the first one-time abortion access. The funds have been awarded to community agencies via RFP, um, and this is an ongoing need that um, began with the, the recent Supreme Court actions. Um, so green cost share, $416,000 in one time in 2023, and then $155,000 one time in 2024. Um, the funds have been encumbered, and so this is the, um, complete as well, and we're helping uh, businesses reduce the disproportional impacts of climate change. Uh, opioid treatment, um, there will be ongoing conversations related to this as well. Um, this, the, the initial funding, uh, $645,000, we're working to get a health coordinator, excuse me, related to opioids um, in place, and that um, that is still in progress, uh, really focusing on treatment and evidence-based approaches to reducing opioid use. Uh, human resources. Uh, this, if, I, if I could pause sorry. you, I think this has to do with opioid uh, peace, Council Member Payne. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I was curious if that line item was associated with the, uh, the uh, opioid settlement dollars or if this is independent and separate from that. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Payne, my understanding is it is associated with the opioid settlement do dollars, and um, I know there, there have been a number of conversations that we've been having internally about the impacts of um, <clears throat> some of the recent uh, actions uh, related to some of the people who have settled mm -hmm. in the op opioids, so we're going to go back and focus and make sure that we only are uh, doing expenditures related to um, the opioid dollars that we have on hand. And are there restrictions on those dollars as it relates to staff investments versus program dollars? 
Um, Madam Chair, Councilmember Payne, I don't believe that there are strict um, strict restrictions. I'll look over at our CFO, um, but of course we don't want to spend. You know what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're not spending it all on staff because it's one time dollars, and so it's really about making sure we have a planful approach um, related to staff spending of op opioid dollars. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, next is human resources for personnel. Um, this is for the DEI project coordinator, um, and I, our CHRO is here as well if there are a lot of questions, um, but I do want to address some of the questions that we've heard so far. Between January and July of 2023, we've onboarded 23 new employees. This is really about increasing the diversity within our workforce. 50% um, of those new employees have been BIPOC, and 42% were female. Um, the applicant diversity has increased significantly, uh, increased by 5% BIPOC and 3% female. Our new hiring, uh, that of course, more applicants translates to better hiring results, um, up 4% BIPOC and new hires and 6% of female new hires. Um, one of the areas that we continue to have challenges is with respect to retention, and that will be the area of focus for the DEI project coordinator to make sure that we are um, changing the culture within the organization um, and maintaining and retaining, excuse me, the, our employees as well. Um, this uh, DI consulting services, that is also a part of that process in terms of working on our strategic planning initiatives and um, securing the pathways and mentorships to make sure that we have, are able to both recruit and maintain our employees. They will work closely. These dollars are going to be administered by the DEI project coordinator. Okay. Information technology for personnel, uh, senior applications analyst. This first position has been filled, um, helping the enterprise become more transparent and capable of analysis of racially desegregated, uh, disaggregated um, data. Business data an analyst is in process. This is, uh, has the same, will work in conjunction with the senior applications analyst um, on this project. Data science scientist one is in process. And project coordinator, we have had a challenge, um, not like, uh, unlike other um, areas in terms of getting, uh, being able to get the compensation to a level that we can get um, folks hired quickly and um, have posted and job offers have been declined. We do plan to repost that position soon. Non-personnel, enterprise payment platform, um, they're 950,000 in 2023, uh, 658,000 in 2024, and then some ongoing, about a million dollars of ongoing fundings. This is online services um, that are currently handled in sort of back office systems uh, to try and make sure that that's more transparent. HRIS phase two is in progress, a million dollars one time in 2023, and four million dollars one time in 2024, to work on a, uh, a system with finance property services, um, really looking at payroll and accounting and trying to have a, a more up-to-date service that will be less um, time intensive for our employees, the employees administering the system. Um, Next, oh, okay. I'm just gonna <clears throat> add my self in queue here for that. I remember having conversations um, before COVID about our current HR system and the need to replace it, the need, you know, just its age and its inability to be uh, updated regularly and just how onerous it was. Is this now finally the beginning of that work? So the one time in 2024 kind of marker, is that a full sale changeover or are we continuing to patch our current HR and finance? Um, Chair Palmasano, I'm going to have Paul Cameron come up here, our CIO, to, to give you more. My short answer to that is um, it's the beginning of the replacement, but he can maybe give you a little bit more of a timeline as well. Thank you. Welcome, Director Cameron. Uh, Chair Palmasano, thank you for the question. Um, so yes, this is the full sale replacement. We are underway. Uh, we currently have a kind of a cross-departmental team. Um, primarily with IT, HR, and finance, uh, and then we're pulling in many of the operational departments as well. Um, our, our current plan is to make a software selection 
uh, later this year and to move forward uh, starting with implementation in 2024. That's great. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, one time uh, for the Salesforce Enterprise Platform, uh, 425,000 and then 354,000 ongoing. This is in progress. Um, we had filled the senior application analyst position that helps with um, contracting and moving these projects forward um, to have sort of new grant types and other things more uh, clearly administered. Contract increases for $321,000. This is complete. These are for existing contracts that we have, and it's really inflationary adjustments related to that. Technology consolidation, $450,000 for, um, for consolidation of existing systems, and that has been complete, and we have contracts in place for that. Uh, moving on to neighborhood and community relations for non-personnel. Um, the first item, there I know there have been some questions here related to the immigrant um, services and expansion of those services. Um, it's $150,000 of one-time monies. Uh, these new resources, the RFP for this closes from September 14th, and new resources will be able to provide services in 2023, um, and hopefully will serve as many as 2,000 individuals with these resources. Um, the next item, American Indian Memorandum of Understanding. This is $48,000 in ongoing resources. This is in progress. Um, contract has been executed with the current organization um, and resources are being spent. This is really about formalizing the relationship between the city and the American Indian community. The third item is loan pro program pilot for $25,000 of one-time resources. This is, was launched in June and we'll be offering a loan program to enable residents to pay filing fees for immigrate, um, new immigrants to our community. Ventura Village Community Safety, $90,000 earmark. Um, the RFP for this work has been issued and there is a review panel in place and um, anticipated to um, move this forward soon. Funding, um, and this is about the public safety measures at Ventura Village. The last item is neighborhood group funding, $134,000 of one-time resources. This is in progress. All funds have been allocated, allocated um, and really trying to focus those on engaging underrepresented populations. And I think Director Mo is here if there are any detailed questions. I put myself in queue um, if to go back to the immigration um, funding piece. This was a one-time increase of 150000 to the existing ongoing 125000 for immigration legal service funding um, to address an increased need for competent, high-quality, free immigration legal services. So I see that the RFP will be released in late July. Um, do we anticipate being able to serve residents with legal services in 2023 or and if so how many residents do we anticipate being able to serve with this it's it's a one-time yep. amount of money which is why i ask uh, expand director mo sure good afternoon council um chair Palmasano. Mm -hmm. uh thank you for the question um you are right the we have ongoing funding for 150,000 that we are releasing the RFP right now, it's open, and that will include both the 150,000 of ongoing as well as the additional, uh, the 125 of ongoing plus the additional 150 of one-time funding. Um, our intention is to have these dollars out in contract and to fund, to support uh, services as many as possible as we can after the contracts are in place in 2023. The contract itself will actually be designed to run through 2024 as well. So there will be no loss of funding or of services. It just might be that they continue to be run through 2024 as well. Um, I'll just explain briefly and say, uh, we had a one-time funding of $25,000 to set up the loan program which actually is designed to assist immigrants with the uh, immigration filing fees. 
it's quite a successful program. We've looked at other cities, including St. Paul, increases the access to citizenship, which is one of our goals as a city. So we spent the beginning of the year really trying to get that program up and running, which we were able to launch this year. Um, with the capacity that we have then, the expanding the Immigration Legal Services RFP took a little bit longer. I will also say that this is an ongoing program. Uh, the past contracts expired, so we actually had to redo a whole new RFP this year. Um, so it took a little bit more work on our end to get it up and running. But we anticipate as soon as the contracts are in place that those funds will immediately start being spent and we will have no problem spending them in 2023 and in 2024. Thank you. And do you have a sense of approximately how many people could be served with this money based on St. Paul's current use of it or something like that? I don't know. I'm just asking you to pontificate. We're not going to hold you to these. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, so first, the loan pilot program is the one that was set up in St. Paul right. that we have expanded here to Minneapolis. And thankfully, we're able to do that with the same provider. So there is consistency across the two cities, making it much more accessible, less confusing for our residents. Regarding the um, immigration legal services, um, our estimate is about 2,000 people. What I'll suggest here is this is a little bit, it's not a $1 to one person served scenario. In some cases, um, we serve many people with few dollars in terms of offering immigration legal clinics. Um, that reduces the cost per person that we serve. But in some cases, the um, Legal situation for some of our immigrant relatives are, or neighbors are um, complicated. They take years. Um, and so the cost is something that um, happens over years. It's not necessarily that's comparable to someone being served by a legal clinic. Our estimate, and it really will depend on the type of contracts that we put in place and the services that we want to offer will help us identify the exact number of people, but our estimate is with the variety of services that we anticipate being able to offer is roughly 2,000 people with a total of 275,000. Thank you. Um, if there are no other questions on NCR, I move to performance management and innovation. Um, related to personnel, we have a number of additions there. Uh, the first is the innovation team planner analyst uh, that was transferred from MPD. That new employee started in late June and is currently being onboarded. Excuse me. Uh, second innovation team planner analyst um, also transferred from MPD started in mid July um, and is in the onboarding process. The Final, Innovation Team Planner Analyst, also transferred from MPD. We are restarting the hiring process again. Uh, we had uh, two candidates uh, that we are hoping to re-engage as part of the existing hiring pool. So the, um, uh, in terms of the overall, as folks know here, part of the go governance structure, these, this, the, the Department of Performance Performance Management and Innovation was created as part of the October actions, um, and that work has been completed. We are in the hiring process, um, at the end of the hiring process, for a director, a new director for that department as well. All right, the next is Public Works. So Public Works non-personnel, um, $1.88 million in ongoing funds for improving roads, trails, and 311 response. Uh, this has been completed. We are uh, continuing to increase the service level related um, for, um, to the cuts that were done during COVID. Um, th this includes both alley snow plowing or snow clearing, excuse me, as well as uh, some seal coating. The second item there, enhanced streetlight sign and right-of-way maintenance, $1.45 million in ongoing funding. This has been complete. Again, this was um, restored funding uh, as a result of some fu uh, budget cuts in COVID. Uh, the, this also includes some pole painting. Uh, Clean City Initiative, $150,000 of one time. This is on hold. We are evaluating the next steps uh, due to some uh, concerns or questions that were raised by legal um, related to statutory authority. So um, more to come on that. Uh, and Live Life Streetlight Improvements, $4.5 million in one-time funding for over 2023 and 2024. 
this is in progress. Uh, we have a design and bid pro uh, package that has been completed and we're, um, and the design has been done and now we're um, waiting to get some bids associated with that work. Um, replacement of over 500 street lights in the city uh, with direct berry wiring. Uh, the next item is electric vehicle charging stations, $200,000 in one-time money in 2023 and $500,000 in one-time money in 2024. We are in the planning process related to those stations. So somebody's very anxious for that electric vehicle charging, it sounds like. <laughs> um, <laughs> the next, next item <laughs> is um, related to racial equity, inclusion, inclusion, and belonging personnel. Um, we have a program manager position. This, again, this new department was created as part of the uh, governance structure changes in October. Um, and these duties are currently, for the program managers, are currently being divided between uh, current staff um, and have been working on the uh, racial inequity report. The LGBTQIA plus program manager, I believe we are getting really close. Um, so this has been posted and I think we're close to hiring on this position. Um, we had to go out and repost because we didn't get a lot of applications the first time, but I think we're getting close now. Um, the 6.41 reflects the government structure changes um, and the reorganization, um, making that a department. The trans equity coordinator, um, the uh, hiring of the interviews have been uh, happening currently, and uh, we will have uh, that position hired and onboarded very soon. Uh, the Anti-racism, the non-personnel items, the anti-racism curriculum, $40,000 of ongoing. Uh, this work is almost complete, including an embodied uh, component related to the training. Um, we have some folks in queue uh, to help us be, uh, to take the training and get feedback on that. Um, the next item is the uh, improvements on our SREP and racial impact, um, equity impact analysis and equity report. That's um, $198,000 of ongoing funding. Um, this is really improving our process, educating um, departments. Um, we want our departments to be uh, well-versed in how to complete these forms, and um, this is a part of that piece. Um, Trans Equity Summit, uh, we are uh, delayed in this. Um, we have $15,000 of ongoing funding and we've supplemented that with some additional funding as well. Um, we have issued an RFP for consultant services. Uh, that has been, I just got back today, so I'm hoping that a selection has been made in that. Um, I know they were being evaluated, so I will know more soon. Um, the final uh, item is the Health and Wellness Direct directory, $70,000 of one-time funding. Uh, we did issue an RFP, and then we went back and reissued an RFP um, to try and um, make sure we got additional responses, and we're moving forward with the vendor selection um, process on that. Um, um, Council Member Vita. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we did get um, vendors to apply for the $70,000 for the health directory? Um, Madam Chair, Council Member Vita, yes, we did. I think we only had uh, a limited number the first time, and so we reopened it, and um, we were able to get a number of different uh, healthcare providers, so. What's the timeline for selecting someone? Um, Madam Chair, Council Member Vita, again, I apologize. I literally got um, back into town this morning, okay. and so um, I'll have to, it was, it was almost, they were evaluating proposals. I'm not sure if that's completed yet, but I will find out and let you know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, Councilmember Chugtai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to just, uh, I see that um, the trans equity coordinator position um, was, is pending completion, interviews were being held, hopefully we'll have someone onboarded soon. I'm curious as to why um, there's a need to wait to hire for that LGBTQIA plus program manager when we are moving forward with the trans equity coordinator position in the absence of a permanent REIB director. I'm sorry. Um, so I, I see for the LGBTQIA program manager, which is I think two slides back. Thank you, okay. One more. 
Yep. So this position, the second one posted here, the LGBTQIA program manager, it says it, for the status that the position is going to be posted once a director is appointed and onboarded. Um, but we are, or you are moving forward with hiring a trans equity coordinator. Can you help me understand why moving forward with hiring one while waiting to even post a position for the second? Uh, Chair Palmasano, Council Member Chuck thanks for the question and for the clarification of the question. Appreciate it. Um, the, this position is a, a program manager position, and my understanding is, is really about having um, our new director having some um, flexibility in terms of making hires um, themselves. And so um, the other one is really we, need, we do need people in here working um, in the coordinator uh, on the Trans Equity Summit, and we want to make sure that that work um, is happening, and so we move forward with that position. So it's really about kind of level of position in the organization and direct reports and giving that person that uh, ability to do so. Okay. But I can, I can circle back and check as well about the timing of posting that because I do think that we have already um, gotten all those items in place, and so I'll just make sure that um, we're getting closer to that unless I think, uh, I don't know if Saray has any other information on that as well, but otherwise. I'll get back to you in terms of timing on getting that hired, because I think it's ready to post. I'm just not sure where we're at. I'll confirm. Awesome. Thank you. Council Member Wansley. Thank you. Um, I just wanted a recap on the SRE uh, equity report. I can't recall if you mentioned a timeline on when council should be expecting to see that. Um, I'll council, or Chair Palmasano, Council Member Wansley, um, that uh, in terms of that's really about training to make sure departments are improving on that and that is in process and I'm the uh, my understanding is that we were hoping to have that done by the end of the year in terms of having that training ready to go so the anti-racism curriculum is separate. oh I'm sorry I oh, thought you said the SRE oh yeah the SRE racial equity impact analysis and equity report so I just assumed that was the actual report that we would be able to see separate from the curriculum yeah, um, Council, uh, Chair Palmasano, Council Member Wansley, I'll check on the timing. My understanding was almost finished, so I'll find out for sure, get okay. the timing on that report. Thank you. Uh, next department is regulatory services uh, personnel. Uh, we had a number of positions that were added here in regulatory services. Um, the first is the field supervisor that has been hired and the candidate is being onboarded. Um, this is really one joint initiative related to um, having a, a supervisor and then eight code compliance specialists. Those first two items, those two items go together. Um, and they are um, intended to be for the overnight shift. And um, that was about 933,000 for the, the nine FTE. Um, and we have six agents that are that were onboarded on uh, June 20th and July 10th, um, and they are in the th three month field training that we have um, that we have them go through as well. Uh, the item, the final item, the homeless outreach coordinator. This is a one ARPA funded FTE uh, that was transferred from CPAD and has been. Uh, the work is ongoing, and that's really about uh, making sure we have stability with respect to the funding of that position. Non-personnel items in regulatory services. Uh, the first item is employee safety, $224,000 in 2023, and then $117,000 in 2024, as well as ongoing. Um, this is really about body cameras, implementation of body cameras um, in regulatory services, and we're having a um, a pilot uh, by traffic control as well as animal control, a 90-day pilot, and then, then we will evaluate how that's working um, on a, as, as that pilot is completed. New system. Um, oh. If I might interrupt you, I think there might have been some additional clarification being sought by Council Member Wansley on the previous topic. Yes, absolutely. The homeless outreach coordinator, so you mentioned the ARPA transfer from CPET, that happened, but the work was ongoing. So is this being funded through 2024, or are we saying this is basically ceased now that, or the ARPA dollars, have they continued, they're run out, the status of that? Uh, 
Chair Palmasano, Councilmember Wansley, and our Interim Director, Kira um, Hasbergen is here as well, but um, there are two different things, is my understanding, and this one is the Homeless Outreach Coordinator that is staffed in regulatory services that coordinate it, coordinates the response for um, the unhoused encampments, um, and the other one is really related to ensuring working with Hennepin County um, in with a contract to um, provide services and ensure that those folks find housing. I believe that's how that breaks down. Looking, and that's, I got a nod, so. For the one, so going back to the question that I raised earlier, so the office to end homelessness, I got that. That's the okay. partnership with yep. Independent County. This one is just one staff position. Is it funded through 2024? Um, chair, Palmasano, Councilmember Wansley, yes, it was on ARPA funds that are supposed to be expiring, and so then this is putting it under the general fund to coordinate those activities. Is that about right? Yep. So there will be permanent funding for this. So I... Thank you. Hi there. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, Chair Pastama, Council Member Wansley, so this was a transfer before with the homeless response team, the outreach coordinators were staffed in different departments. So at the beginning of last year, we did transfers to move them all into regulatory services. So that is the transfer that you see there that uh, has been completed. Um, we did, uh, as, you, as part of the mayor's uh, budget uh, recommendation last week, you did see that it has been recommended for to move this team into the general fund. Um, right now the team is only funded, one of the, I think, few teams um, with ARPA funding is only funded through 2023. Um, so that that funding will end. Um, some of the other ARPA funding does go through 2024, but mm -hmm. the homeless response team, um, theirs was uh, sunsetted then. So this position is part of that team. Um, and again, if it is um, approved in the, in the budget, would move into the general fund. Got gotcha. you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Sorry for that. I just didn't want it, us to get too far along and then backtrack back to that. So thank you. Back to that. services. All right. Um, the we talked about the employee safety and the the pilot for the body camera. Um, the second is nuisance abatement, one hundred thousand dollars in ongoing funding, and this is really um, focused on board ups, and um, it's about forty four percent expended, um, and that, which is or it's. Year to date is 44% more, excuse me, in 2023 than it was in 2022. Um, 311 service center personnel. I know that folks have, um, we've had a lot of conversations related to responses within um, 311. And we, as part of the government restructure, we transfer that and, to, and combine it with the service center. So we have both a 311 call center and the service center combined. Um, that has, um, worked uh, or that has that transfer has been complete and um, we have a, a new director of that uh, combined 311 service center in place as well um, some non-personnel items in 311 the login licenses this is the system that we're currently using um, to handle uh, resident requests uh, it's about thirty thousand dollars of one-time money and then um, that we have gone ahead and purchased those licenses, that's complete, and then the update is 16,000 in ongoing, um, and we're in the process of negotiating um, with the vendor on the ongoing, uh, the ongoing case, cases, so. Um, one thing I do wanna mention, uh, we had structured this around the departments as requested, um, and then I got a, a call from the mayor's office. They wanted to make sure that they, that they were transparent and that the two positions, the new positions that were in the mayor's office um, have also been hired. There was one that was hired in February and the other person started today. And so um, I didn't have really a, a separate department um, that was the mayor's office, but wanted to make sure that I mentioned that in transparency for the council. With that, I stand for any additional questions. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, I don't see anyone in queue yet. I will ask if we could go back to the reg services slides. There was a transfer of nine FTEs into reg services. Um, ultimately, yep, there, nope. <laughs> um, it, ultimately, it was for nine FTEs, a field supervisor and eight code compliance specialists to help um, handle increases in traffic management, parking complaints, special events, that kind of thing. Um, can you help us understand? It says candidates are onboarded and in training. So is it fair to say that those new staff are out in the field controlling traffic and helping to manage parking situations? 
uh, Council Member Palmasano, I'm going to defer to our interim director on that in terms of because I know there's still there's a three month onboarding process that I mentioned, and so I'll let you respond to that. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Um, Chair Palmasano, so yes, um, right now they are out in the field under training. Um, so they are not directing by themselves. It's a three, months tra a three month training program. So those new agents are out there, um, you know, being mentored and trained by existing agents. Um, so hopefully again, we, you know, assess how they're doing and they should be able to move onto their own. I would also like to clarify that this is for the late night shift. So it is not general during the day. This was for the, those two extended hours um, to the shift. So they're Tuesday through Saturday. The two shifts are 6.30 to 3 and then 10 p.m. to 6. So they do some of the things that you mentioned, primarily the special events things are at night in the downtown and warehouse district, supporting things like Warehouse Live, which we heard about, um, and then also responding to non-emergency MPD requests 311 request is residents may submit through those smart sheet forms and our agents will go out if applicable. Um, 911 dispatch calls and are also supporting MPD enclosures, so street closures and things like that directing. But again, it is that late night shift that, that we started, which is five, five nights a week. So specifically just for that time is when we're providing that support. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions or comments from my colleagues. Are there any other questions or co comments from my colleagues? colleagues I'll ask one more time thank you thank you for having this um, full-on presentation I think it's uh, it's something that was dear to Councilmember Koski um, in this budget process was that we start by taking a look at how some of the change items have gone this year so seeing no further discussion I'll ask the clerk to file that report um, and seeing no further business before us I will declare this meeting adjourned Thank you, everyone. There has been recent research that's showing that bee populations are declining. So we're doing this because there is habitat loss going on, there is different pesticides that are harming our bee populations, and